Hey, good evening, all of you. Great to see you guys here tonight. Uh, can you guys hear me loud and clear? Right, if anyone of you can't hear me, please do let me know, all right? Okay. Hey, thank you. Good evening, Samuel. Thank you, Clement. All right. Um, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Hazel from the Joyful Investors. Right. We focus on sharing with you uh, valuable content that will empower individuals on their journey towards uh, FIRE, right? financial independence and retire early. So from money mindset uh, to stock market insights to investment strategies, right? what we aim to do is to equip our community with the knowledge as well as the tools right, uh, that they need to make more informed financial decisions. So you can follow us and learn more from uh, the various content that we create on uh, the social media platforms. Like uh, we are on Telegram channel, right? We are also on a uh, YouTube channel, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, as well as our uh, tracks, right? All under the handle of the Joyful Investors. So tonight's sharing uh, is part of our monthly Zoom webinar, right? Our monthly Zoom update to share about what has been happening in the markets recently, right? And as well as our insights on uh, the stock markets. So do join us live on Zoom if you're available so that you can receive more timely updates from us, right? So before I begin, um, the usual disclaimer, anything that we share tonight is not uh, financial advice. It is not a financial recommendation. So this is just my personal opinion, uh, sharing with you from the educational point of view. So before you make any investment decisions, please do your own research and do your own due diligence. So this is the agenda for tonight's sharing. I will first kick off with uh, the sharing on the update on the US stock markets, right? Um, covering some of these key events that have happened uh, recently in this month. Right, and I'll also share with you my personal take on those events as well. Now, after which we will then move on to the Singapore REITs market, right, which hasn't really seen much uh, recovery yet so far. So what kind of mindset uh, should you take on if you're looking to invest in uh, Singapore REITs? And what's the thought process that you can um, have to identify some investment opportunities in the Singapore REITs market? Right, but before I continue further, Okay, let's do a poll first. Let me launch the poll. Now let's do a poll first, right? Uh, I've just launched a poll. Can you share with me how do you feel about the US uh, swap markets? How do you feel about the recent uh, US market pullback? Right, share with me in the poll. Okay, keep your answers coming in. Those of you who have not yet selected. None of it, Clement, why is it none of it? <laughs> is it because you are not uh, invested in the US stock markets? Neutral, okay, there are some who are neutral. Okay, perhaps it's because you are neutral, is it? Okay, so let me take a look at um, the poll results, huh? Okay, based on the poll results, actually, it's rather half-half. It's quite half-half. Uh. Half of you guys are feeling bullish. Half of you guys are actually kind of starting to get wary of this recent pullback, and you're starting to feel a little bit bearish, right? Oh, Clement, you're always bearish. <laughs> okay, so uh, it seems like um, it's about half-half, right? I'm going to end the poll right now. Okay. So... For the US stock markets, right, um, in the last one month, one of the key topics that was widely discussed about is this rising oil prices, right? Um, the US oil prices climbed above the $90 mark for the first time uh, since October and since November uh, last year, 2022, right? This was the last time where um, the crude oil prices hit $90 mark, right? But recently, we, we saw that the crude oil prices have been increasing, right? And it has hit the $90 mark yet again. So, um, what exactly has happened? 
how come oil prices are increasing, right? So what is resulting in this oil prices? Now, before we get into the details of what has exactly happened, uh, we need to first understand that prices of commodities, they are highly dependent on the demand and supply uh, of commodities. So commodities like oil, the prices are very dependent on the demand and supply, right? So this is why in, um, it makes the commodities market even much more unpredictable because of this demand and supply, right? The demand and supply, it can take a turn all of a sudden, right? So the latest oil market rally, it has been driven by concerns um, about the supply of oil, okay? So in particular, Saudi Arabia and Russia said earlier this month that they will be extending their cuts in uh, the oil supplies through the rest of 2023. So you know that when supply falls, right, what's going to happen? That's going to drive up the price of oil. Okay, so this is why the oil price is actually rising. Uh, but the bigger concern that people have, or rather investors have, is that you know this oil price increase, it may then add more pressure on the current inflation situation, which may then result in uh, either you know, steeper rate hikes or delays in the cut. Uh, in the rate cuts next year, which in fact, um, the the Fed right has recently talked about how they may actually they have signaled that the rate pause right may continue longer before we see uh rate cuts happening uh in in the next year to come. Okay, so this is what many investors are concerned about. Okay, because if inflation increases, then uh that might actually affect how the Fed may react to this right, and maybe the stock market might be impacted. Okay. So the latest inflation data for US, right, came in for August. It showed that um, the overall inflation rate, okay, which is uh, this one over here, the overall inflation rate, it is at 3.7%. Uh, so which is actually higher than the previous month, if you take a look over here, right? That is, this one is uh, July, then the 3.7, the one in circle, that is uh, August. So this actually marks the second straight month where we saw the overall inflation in the U.S. climbing up. Now, but on the positive side, the core inflation actually fell to uh, 4.3%, which shows that there is still some kind of very steady slowdown in the prices uh, since the Fed embarked on the rate hikes. Now, some of you may be thinking, what's the difference between uh, headline inflation and what's the difference between uh, core inflation? Now, um, headline inflation, it takes into account of all the basket of goods, whereas core inflation, right, it excludes certain volatile items like food and energy where the prices can actually fluctuate quite a bit, okay? So you may be thinking, okay, then which one is actually more important, right? Um, so the thing is, which one does the Fed actually focuses more on when they are evaluating uh, inflation? So let's take a look at what the Fed says, okay? Because it's not what we say, it is what the Fed says, right? So if we go to the direct source, right? Um, we go to the Federal Reserve website under this um, FAQ section, uh, uh, they talk about you know, what is inflation, how does the Fed evaluate the changes in the rate of inflation. So let's take a look at um, what it says. Okay, I've already uh, screenshot some of the key points over here. So you can see over here, this one that is boxed up and there are some words that are underlined. It says that uh, the Federal Open Market, the FOMC right, judges that an annual increase in inflation of 2% in price index for personal consumption expenditure. So personal consumption expenditure stands for PCE, okay? And the Fed largely uses, uh, it uses the PCE price index largely because it covers a wide range of household spending. And at the bottom over here, you see that in addition, policymakers they examine a variety of core inflation measures to help identify inflation trends. Now, although food and energy makes up a huge makes up an important part of the budget for most households, right? But ultimately, when you when, what the policymakers are looking at is they want to seek stability in terms of the overall consumer pricing, right? So that's why uh, they take a look at core inflation measures, which will then leave out the more volatile pricing for food, for um, things like energy. Okay, that will be more useful for them in assessing the inflation trends. Now, so we got this straight from um, the... The fact, right, we've got this straight from the fact, right, that they say they focus us more on the core inflation. In fact, they talk about core PCE, 
right? This is what they mentioned. Now, um, at the moment, we do not have the August data for uh, core PCE yet. It will be released only uh, after tomorrow, okay? But uh, if we could take a look at core CPI, which is uh, generally quite a, a good gauge like, of the core PCE, because the two price indexes, they largely move in very similar manner. If we take a look at core PCE as a gauge for core core CPI as a gauge for our core PCE, then you can see that generally we are still heading in a, in a positive direction where the core inflation is easy. Okay, so, so this is something we can actually look out for when uh, the core PCE data is out for August. Now, but having said that, no matter how the stock market moves, right? How, how does US stock market moves eventually? We need to know uh, what eventually what do we want to do, right? And how do we react as an investor? Now, because after all, we cannot predict how inflation will be like six months down the road. Who can predict that, right? Uh, even the Fed can, can do that. Or we also cannot predict how strong the economy will be doing in, in the future six months or 12 months down the road. Or whether there will be any sudden events that can impact the stock market, right? So no matter what happens, eventually we must know, no matter where the stock market moves, we need to know how to react as an investor. And the thought process is really simple. Now, let me share with you. So if today the stock market goes through a deeper pullback, right, a deeper pullback, that means it comes down even more, then that could be an opportunity for you, for investors to be accumulating more shares of the quality companies that are fundamentally sound. Now, but what happens if it is the opposite? If the stock market continues to move up, continues to rally up on, on, on the bull run, then your existing portfolio will grow in value, right? Whatever positions that you are holding on to right now, it will be growing in value. And that something that you can ask yourself is, okay, then at this point in time, uh, would I have to consider taking profits for some of the overextended stock positions so that I can recycle my capital for any other upcoming stock opportunities? So, so these are things that you, you think about, that you ponder about and ask yourself, right? Um, why, why do I talk about taking profits is because after all, most of us, we have very limited capital, right? We are limited by how much we earn uh, every month and how much uh, you actually can set aside to for investment purposes. So sometimes where there are certain stock positions which are overextended, um, we might consider taking profits and recycle this capital into other good stocks as well, uh, where uh, they're trading at lower prices with a better risk to reward. So this is the kind of thought process. So what you've got to do is you simply just repeat this entire thought process over and over again as we go through the various stock market fluctuations. Whether the stock market is going up or, or coming down, I know what to do. I know what is my action as an investor. So that this entire process of investing, this entire journey, it can be more simplified if we follow through a systematic process, okay? So when we are able to take on such a healthy mindset, Eventually, we will come to realize that no matter how the stock market moves, or whether it's going up uh, or whether it's coming down, it becomes a win-win situation for you, right? Because either you get the opportunity to accumulate more assets or whatever you have right now, it is going in value, okay? So no matter what, you see that it's actually a win-win situation for you, okay? So by taking on such a, such a mindset, this is how you can then continue on your investing journey joyfully over the long term, right? So that you will not be getting stressed out when you see market pullbacks and so on. Okay, so this is the kind of investing thought process that uh, it will be good for you to take on so that you know, no matter what happens, I know what I should be doing, okay? And you will not be lost in the stock markets. Now, in fact, right now, uh, if you take a look at the S&P 500, uh, using that as a gauge for the overall U.S. stock market, right? You can see that the U.S. Uh, the U.S. S&P 500 is currently undergoing some pullback. Okay, so those of you who have actually attended the previous Zoom webinar that was back in uh, end of August uh, last month. Right, you if you were present in though in that webinar, you may recall that um, I actually shared that if this if the S and P five hundred goes through a, a retracement soon, then the four hundred and thirty level is one possible support where the market may do a rebound from. Um, and if the pullback goes deeper, then the next level will be somewhere around four two zero. Right, both of which they coincided with uh, the previous uh resistance. Okay. So right now, where are we? Okay, so this chart is taken 
as at 27 September 2023, okay, before yesterday market uh, closed, okay. So right now, the S&P 500 has already broken below the 430 level, okay. Um, so possibly it might uh, hit the 420, 420 might be a possible uh, support where there could be a possible rebound, okay. In fact, if you take a look at where the market went to, uh, it actually you actually went to somewhere near the 420 level before it closed up higher, okay? So you can take a look at the most recent stock chart, right, Um, from, from your other platforms, okay? Because this one that you see is not the most recent one. It's taken about two, two days ago when I was uh, preparing for the slides, okay? But overall, you can see that the uptrend is still intact. Now, how do we know that uptrend is still intact? Because there are higher highs, right, and higher lows, okay? So the overall uptrend is still intact for the S&P 500. So despite having this current pullback, this uptrend is still intact. In fact, currently this pullback, I think, is is, is just about 10%, right? Uh, the last time I keep track was slightly less than 10%, right? So in fact, it's actually not yet a correction uh, because um, uh, by definition, a correction is 10% uh, or more, uh, Right, uh, and this is not definitely not a crash as well right now, based on where we have what what we are seeing uh for the stock markets right now. Okay, so um being able to analyze the stock market price movements, okay, will it will help to give us an added advantage where we can read where the stock markets are actually heading towards. And not just that, you can also use the analysis to help you identify uh support levels where there is a higher chance of a rebound, so that you can actually possibly you might actually enter or buy at those support levels. So for instance, instead of uh, buying at you know, the highs over here, I always like to wait for a retracement or a pullback to a possible support level before I enter so that the risk to reward for me is actually much better. Okay, So this is just an example using S&P 500. But when I'm doing this for uh, individual stock purchases, I go through the same way, the same analysis as well, right? using technical analysis. Okay, so moving on, um, what else happened this month? Earlier this month, we also saw the blockbuster uh, IPO of ARM Holdings on NASDAQ, right? So for those of you who are not as familiar with this company, ARM Holdings, uh, it's actually a British chip design company. So unlike some other semiconductor companies that you may know about, like for example, Intel or uh, TSMC, okay? Those companies, they have the fabrication facilities to manufacture the chips. Now, but for ARM Holdings, what they do is they provide the processor technology for most of the world's smartphones, okay? So if you are using, say, uh, you know, an iPhone, likely, right, it is uh, using this the, the processor technology from ARM Holdings, okay? So what they do is that they will develop this processor technology called the ARM ISA, and uh, they would then license this processor technology to companies like Apple, to companies like Samsung, who will then use uh, who will then use this technology to make their processors, okay, using the technology by ARM Holdings. So for example, if you are a MacBook user, okay, you may know that in the last couple of years, Apple has transitioned to using its own Apple Silicon chips. And this Apple Silicon chips Right, they are made using the ARM technology for MacBook. So they are no longer using the Intel chips, but instead their own uh, silicon chips. So naturally, many investors uh they were feeling excited about the IPO of this ARM holdings. Okay. And uh, there were there were also widespread news covering about the blockbuster uh, IPO, talking about how you know this ARM IPO is the biggest this year and so on. Right. You probably have seen one or two of, of these news articles somewhere online, okay? So some of you have actually asked, are we keen in investing in ARM Holdings in this IPO? Right, so our answer is actually no, not at the moment at least, okay? Uh, we have shared frequently, in fact, on uh, our blog posts, articles, as well as on our Telegram channel that uh, usually we do not subscribe to shares during the IPO stage, right? Usually we do not do that. And the reason is because IPOs, they are rarely priced to benefit the retail investors at the onset. Because you see, when, when a stock has garnered enough uh, growth, enough interest to be an IPO-worthy candidate, oftentimes it is at the peak of its current cycle, 
right, where the perceived value is much higher than its true value. So the IPO is usually released when we are at the highest level of euphoria and optimism for the stock. And this means to say that the companies, as existing shareholders and their insiders, they are selling their shares to you at a higher price. So therefore, usually buying an IPO can be rather risky. So that's why usually we do not subscribe to shares during their IPO stage. In fact, if you take a look at some data, um, oftentimes the stock price performance of IPO stocks, they do not do as well. They do not fare as well in the initial phase of the IPO. Initially, on the very first trading day, they, the share price will typically rally. Yes, initially on the first day, it will typically rally and they will get many investors excited. Now, in fact, based on the data from Goldman Sachs, it says that from 1995 to the year 2019, IPO stocks typically rose by 10% on their first trading day. Right Then during 2020 to 2021, uh, the IPO bubble, the, the average increase is about 15% for IPO stocks. So usually on the first day, it will increase, right? which will get a lot of investors excited. So similarly, if you take a look at ARM holdings, right? initially, yes, it did increase. right? It rose as much as, um, let's see, 20, 20 over percent, right? 20 over percent in the first two days of trading upon IPO. But before you also get excited as well, let's take a look. Huh? Now, usually what happens after this is that some of these IPO stocks, they will then start to see a decline in their share price performance. Now, let's take a look at some examples. For example, if you take a look at Meta, right? Um, Meta, in the this is where the IPO, when you first IPO, now, even after one year, you see, this is June, right? This is the next June. Even after one year of IPO, the share price was still not back to the IPO price level. Similarly, if you take a look at Salesforce, okay, this is Salesforce when it IPO. Um, so it came down initially, then after which, after some time, it, it is only barely back to the IPO levels. Now, Snowflake as well. Uh, when an IPO in, in sometime in late 2020, you could still remember. So initially it was increasing, right? It, it wrote on that stock market rally that we had after the COVID crash, but after which it came crashing down already. Okay, or in Singapore, we have the digital core read that some of you may be familiar about. So you can see this was when the IPO and then after which is uh, all the way down, right? A, a downtrend. So this is the reason why we usually stay away from IPO stocks in their initial uh, phase of listing until the stock shows it is able to show a steady uptrend over time in terms of their stock price movement. And of course, uh, in terms of the financials, it must show to, show to be able to uh, have a, a strong set of financials. Like you can see stable revenue, growth, profits, cash flows, right? Or at least over a couple of years before we are convinced about the fundamentals. So these are the two things that we will actually keep a lookout for um, until we are actually keen to be, to be invested in any um, IPO stocks, right? So usually at the initial phase of this thing, we are not interested in subscribing subscribing for more of the shares, okay? So this is for the ARM Holdings IPO. Now, what else happened this month? Earlier on, right, the Wall Street Journal actually published an article talking about how China bans iPhone use for government officials at work. Now, on the following day, Bloomberg also released an article that says that China is going to broaden this iPhone ban uh, to state firms agency, right? hinting that the impact of this ban may get even larger. So this is something that uh, a lot of people are talking about this month as well. Um, but interestingly, if you take a look at what China says, uh, China authorities, they responded and said that, no, there are no laws, there are no rules to ban the use of iPhone, uh, Apple iPhone or any other foreign phone brand, right? Uh, but it seems that this is just another you know, tip for tap between the US and China again, right? So since then, if you take a look at Apple shares, right, this is a stock chart for Apple, you can see that um, Apple shares saw a pullback of about 10% uh, from the all-time high. Of course, this is again not the latest uh, Apple stock chart, okay? Um, and you may have also seen a couple of articles 
online or videos covering about the bearish impact on Apple, uh, given that Apple actually derives about 20% of the revenue from the greater China, right? So there are also certain articles that tells you, okay, so Apple, they have $74 billion uh, of their revenue suddenly at risk, right? So seeing numbers like 20%, 74 billion, right? It, it may look very scary at first glance. Now, but bear in mind that not everything that we read online, that we uh, watch online, it should be taken at face value. So firstly, let's move on to understand what has ex exactly happened, right? How, how did they come up with this number? 74 billion, 20%. So this is where they actually come up with the numbers. Now, Apple generates about 20% of its total revenue from Greater China, geographically, right, 20%, okay? So if you could see over here, this is uh, about 20%, right, 20%. Um, and in terms of absolute numbers, this sums up to be about $74 billion last year in FY 2022 financial report, okay? But if you think about it, this 20%, right, or this um, $74 billion, it actually comprises of all the sales from iPhones, from Mac, from iPad, from uh, their wearables, as well as from their services, everything, right? Uh, not just iPhones itself only. So if I'm saying that $74 billion uh, is at risk or if 20% uh, of their revenue is at risk, it's equivalent to saying that China is banning all Apple products. China is banning all the Apple services completely. Uh, which is not what is happening right now, okay? In fact, if you take a look at the recent iPhone 15 launch, uh, hundreds of people still queued up and lined up at the flagship Apple store in Beijing. <laughs> so if you want to make a better gauge of the impact of this iPhone ban um, on Apple, then we got to do some calculations and some we have to put in some assumptions as well. So let's take a look at what could be a potential impact on Apple, okay? It's a potential because no one knows for sure, right? So what we know on top of this 20%, what else do we know? We also know that iPhone sales makes up about 52% of the total sales um, for FY 2022, right? So you can see over here, iPhone makes up about 52% of the total sales as compared to the other revenue segments. So if, let's say, all Chinese citizens, every Chinese citizen, they are banned from using Apple iPhone, then the potential impact could be the 52% multiplied by a 20%, right? So 52% is the, the sales coming from iPhones multiplied by the 20% revenue that's generated from, from uh, Greater China. So potentially that's about a 10% a 10 impact. But this is if all Chinese are banned from carrying an iPhone including those who are not working with government, you also cannot use iPhone, right? Uh, but right now it is rumored that only the employees who are working with, with the government, they may be subjected to this ban. So how big will this impact be? Now we don't have the exact figures, but um, what the various analysts have come up with is this. Various analysts, they have estimated that this impact would be somewhere between 5 million, to 20 million unit of iPhone, right? Um, so if we divide this 5 million and this 20 million by 230 million, which is the estimated total number of iPhone sales that is sold annually in a year worldwide, then the potential impact could range between 2% uh, to 8%, right? So if we break it down and understand the estimated impact on Apple, it would not be as alarming as you know, the initial 20% impact or that, uh, what is it, $74 billion impact, right? So at the moment, if you ask me, I'm, I'm not too concerned about this rumored ban of iPhones in China yet, right? Considering the potential impact, as well as that Apple has been delivering very strong sell financial over the years, right? But do take note that um, Apple holds the, it carries the heaviest weight on S&P 500, right, over here. Right. This is the top 10 holdings of the S&P 500. So Apple carries the heaviest weight on the S&P 500. So if it goes through a deeper retracement, then it may also put some track on the performance of S&P 500 as well. Unless the other uh, major counters, right, they, they, are, they have a significant weight, they are able to rally to offset um, the drag that is caused by Apple. Okay, But as I shared with you guys earlier on, it is... Um, 
is how you put things into perspective that will determine how you do in the markets, right? If the stock market or if the good businesses, they are showing weakness in their stock prices, then we are not going to see it as a crisis, but instead you could actually view it as an opportunity for you to add more shares, right? So that is a thought process. Uh, but when it comes to the actual execution, you got to also know how exactly to execute in the stock market. Like uh, what kind of investing strategies that you can take? Because there are so many different investing strategies out there. Uh, how do I go about choosing and employing the one that is suitable for me? So for those of you who are quite new to investing, or maybe you have already invested in the stock markets for some time, but um, perhaps you're still unsure, quite unsure about how to invest better, you can also check out our two-part series videos on how to choose the investing strategy that is suitable for you, right? But in the interest of time for today's Zoom, right, I'm not going to share about this. You can just check out these videos that are available on um, our YouTube channel already. So the first part of the video is spells out the various investing strategies that are commonly adopted, right? Like um, strategies to help you determine what to buy, strategies to determine when do you buy, right? Whereas the second video, the second part, it talks about um, the thought process, on how do you choose and identify the strategy that aligns with your investment objective and that aligns with the type of investment that you are looking at. So if you're new to investing or today, if you are you are still thinking of how to actually improve on your, on your investing investment strategies, you can actually check out these two videos to revisit the topic, right? To, to assess if all along you have been employing a suitable strategy for yourself, right? For the investment that you are undertaking. So both videos are already available on our YouTube channel. Okay, moving on. We will now move on to the Singapore uh, REITs market. Okay, um, but before I go on, I'd just like to have a feel of um, how you guys are you know, invested in the REITs market. So let me launch a poll. Okay. Okay, I've just launched a poll, right? Can you guys let me know how many of you are actually already invested in the Singapore REITs market? Uh, or how many of you are not invested yet, but you're thinking, okay, I, I'm actually keen to start, right? But perhaps I'm not too sure how, how to go about. Or maybe you are not interested at all in, in Singapore bits, right? Just let me know in the poll, right? So, okay, I'll wait a while more for the rest of you to answer the poll. Oh, okay, it seems that most of you are actually holding on to some Singapore REITs position, yes, okay. Yeah, most of you, uh, about 70 to 80% of you are actually invested in Singapore REITs, right? And a small number of you are thinking of starting, but not too sure um, where to, where to um, begin. So for the Singapore REITs market, right, the overall REIT market is still in a downtrend, okay? So this is the stock chart for the Lion Philippe um, as read ETF, right? Uh, the tickle CLR that we use as a benchmark for the overall Singapore REITs market. So you can see that overall the REITs market is still in a downtrend. Likewise, if you take a look at individual REITs, uh, you will also see that most of them are in a downtrend, except for a very, very small hand. Like for example, one of them is uh, Capital DC, right? Which actually managed to show uh, a change into a short-term uptrend over here. Um, another one that we have is... Uh, at Capital Land Escort Trust, which is in a consolidation, right? Not, not a downtrend. Uh, then we also have a Capital Land Ascenders REIT yeah, that is in a more of a consolidation in the short term. But most of the other Singapore REITs, right, they are still um, pretty much in a downtrend, okay? But having said that, the advantage of uh, Singapore REITs, right, is that even though majority of them have their share prices on a downtrend right now, um, but the more stable ones, they are still able to continue to distribute consistent dividends. Okay, so this is especially beneficial for for investors who are looking for you know a consistent cash flow. For example, retirees who are living on the dividends. So consistent cash flow is their priority. So then Singapore REITs investments would, would be something that is um suitable for them, right? So just like what I shared earlier on with you guys, right? When a market is down, it does not necessarily that it's just all doom and gloom, right? On the flip side, it can also mean to say that, oh, that could be an opportunity for more asset accumulation to own some of the sound REITs, the more stable Singapore REITs. So let me share with you how you should actually go about identifying the opportunities in the Singapore REITs market, 
uh, using one of the reads that we mentioned earlier on, which is Ascenders read, right? Capital Land Ascenders read. The tickle symbol is A17U, right? So for those of you who are not familiar, okay, Ascenders read is an industrial read. Uh. So it primarily focuses on owning, owning and managing the portfolio of industrial, logistics, um, business parks, uh, properties, okay? And they do not only just have the properties in Singapore, but they also have the properties in the United States, in the in Australia, in UK, and so on. So let's just take a very quick look at um, the most recent financial performance from the uh, from the REIT. So from what it was last reported, right, it was the first half of FY twenty twenty three financials. So we see that the gross revenue managed to actually increase, right, a positive. Percentage. Uh, likewise, the NPI, the net property income, also continue to increase. Now, but unfortunately, the, if you take a look at the total amount available for distribution, it actually went down slightly. Similarly, for the DPU as well, right? So this is actually due to the higher uh, interest rate environment, right? Which is affecting the their DPU by slightly. So it is slightly down uh, by about two percent. Okay. But um, I would say that if you consider the overall distribution pattern of uh, attendance reads, right, this is their historical um, DPU amount. I would say that they generally have been able to show a good track record of, of growing its DPU over the years, right? So for example, if you take a look, this is FY1415, right? From here to here, it is an increase, right? Then this is an increase, increase as well, increase, um, then this, one is because uh, of a financial year change, that's why it's smaller. Then after which we have the COVID, that's why it dropped, right? So if you exclude the impact of COVID, in fact, generally has been able to show a good track record of um of um, their consistent distribution in terms of the DPU and they are able to actually grow their DPU over time. And if you take a look at the occupancy rate, similar, okay, it is maintained at about 94 94%, right, which is similar to the previous quarters as well. So, um, and the REIT also managed to uh, have um, overall portfolio rental reversion of 18%, okay? So that means when they renew their leases, they are able to renew to their tenants at a higher rental rate, okay? So this is what rental reversion is about. So fundamentally, Ascenders REIT is actually doing well. Now, but the next question to ask ourselves would then be, um, at what price would it be attractive for me to want to buy more units of the REIT? Okay, so this is then where I would then go to the stock charts for Ascenders REIT to analyze using technical analysis. Now, for some of you who have attended our previous uh, REITs workshop, you might have already been able to identify for yourself the opportunities to invest in uh, Ascender REITs in the past few months, right? Because we actually teach you this during the workshop, we actually gone through this. But just a quick disclaimer, huh? this is not a financial recommendation, right? So please do your own due diligence. Now, if you take a look at this stock chart over here, which is for Ascenders REIT, uh, you can see that there is somewhere a horizontal support somewhere around the $2.70 um, cents mark over here, which is which I draw using a, a black color horizontal line, right? So we use support levels to help us identify the entry price to buy because technically wise, there is a higher chance of a rebound from the support level. So if you take a look, in fact, in the second half of the year, Okay, this region that I highlight, you can see that the prices, in fact, it retested this support level a couple of times, uh, sometime in uh, June, in, in July, as well as in August, right? So if you were thinking of um, investing in Ascenders Reed back in those times, those were actually possible entry points where the price, where the risk to reward is, is more in your favor because there is a higher chance of a rebound from the support level in terms of probability-wise. Now, but please take note that technical analysis is not a 100% fail-proof uh, analysis, okay? Right? Uh, nothing is 100% fail-proof. Uh, There's no methodology, no strategy that is 100% fail-proof. Meaning to say that there could be certain occasions where, you know, let's say they hit the support level, but this support level actually, they actually break below the support level. So the support level actually fails. So this is why usually, right, we, we don't buy all in the one shot, but uh, usually we will buy in stages, okay? So because... um. Technical analysis is not 100% fail-proof, right? So right now, if you take a look at where we are currently, uh, which is the last candle over here, you can see that the prices are 
seems to be heading down back again after the rebound that we had in late August, right? Right now it's heading back down again. So if assuming today I don't own any units of a Sanders REIT and I'm thinking I want to invest in a Sanders REIT, I want to build up some positions over time, then what I will do is I'll wait for the price to hit this support level again, to revisit this support level again before I will uh, buy in. Right? So this is how I use technical analysis to, to help me identify the desired entry prices. Right? So I hope you guys uh, understand what um, I'm talking about right? and the thought process that goes through my mind. Right? So first, I identify a stock that is fundamentally sound, after which then I apply technical analysis to help me identify the price level that I want to buy at Okay, um, so that the risk reward is more in favour. So to sum up, even though Singapore REITs, it may look very unattractive right now because of this downtrend uh, and the declining share prices, but nonetheless, it is actually a good time for, for investors to do some asset uh, accumulation, okay, asset accumulation, where the risk to reward is in your favor. Now, um, asset, what, what, you should, what we should do is we should only buy, right, the sound Singapore REITs, and we do so by analyzing their financial performance, and after which we accumulate them at the appropriate price levels where the risk to reward um, is in your favor, is more in your favor, all right? So this is the whole thought process that I will, that I will go through to identify opportunities in the stock market. So especially right now, right, many of the risks, right, they could be at a certain good support levels, price levels where the risk to reward is more in favor. So we should always understand that Asset accumulation is a big part of wealth creation. Now, similar to how we play a game of Monopoly, right? I think most of us have played before a game of Monopoly. Our, obje our objective is to own more assets, right? Our objective in Monopoly is to own more assets, right? So that eventually it can generate income for us, right? No one will play a Monopoly just by going one round, two rounds, just keep going round and round and pay rent to other people. You keep paying rent to other people, but you don't want to collect income. Right? Nobody plays a game of Monopoly like that. So if you don't play a game of Monopoly like that, then likewise, in the real financial markets, right, we shouldn't be doing this as well. Okay, So in the stock markets, our objective is to own more productive assets at good prices to efficiently utilize our limited capital. Okay, So this is the uh, market update that I want to share with you guys for the month of uh, September. Okay. Um, for those of you who wish to take a further step to you know, learn more about how to pick Singapore REITs, how do you build out your own portfolio of REITs to, to earn passive income, you can also join us on our upcoming workshop, which is on uh, 8 October, a Sunday afternoon, where we'll teach you to apply the framework to cherry pick the Singapore REITs to invest in. And uh, we'll also teach you how to buy Singapore REITs at reasonable prices. Something which many investors, they either just totally ignore or they, they don't know that they, they should be buying at reasonable prices, right? So in fact, right now, if you take a look at the Singapore REITs market, there, there are some good opportunities for investors to tap on if you are looking to build up a REITs portfolio. So if you are keen to learn more, you can just simply scan this QR code over here, right? Uh, and you can sign up via Eventbrite. So this workshop will be on a face-to-face -face setting so that uh, learning is more conducive. So it's not over Zoom like, like what we have today. Yeah? Alternatively, if you want to learn more about stock chart analysis using a range of tools, we also have a separate workshop itself where we will dedicate more time to talking about this and teaching you on this. So we'll spend more time to go through the basics right, of analyzing the stock chart price movements so that you can identify the appropriate price levels to buy as well as to sell, right? Instead of just randomly buying, selling based on what I hear from my friends, right? Or what I see from the market or because the economy is going to be in a recession, things like that, okay? So all this is to help you make more informed decisions to maximize the profits in the investment in the stock market. So the next session will be also in October, 22nd October, right? Uh, you can scan the same QR code, QR code over here to uh, sign up via Eventbrite. Now, in the event, if let's say you sign up, right, then you, you, or you can't make it for you know, any of the dates right now, simply just follow us on Eventbrite and follow us on our Telegram channel so that you'll be in the loop for the future sessions when they are open for enrollment.